Okay, welcome to the EGM 37 additive manufacturing uh, e-lecture series. This is e-lecture two, introduction to additive manufacturing. Uh, in this uh, e-lecture, we're going to cover uh, what is additive manufacturing, the basic process, we give a brief historical development of machines throughout the last two decades. We'll talk about types of different systems and the types of different materials which we can uh, uh, added, use in additive manufacturing. We'll talk about the size of the builds and the scales um, and we'll look at individual systems on a one-by-one -one basis and some of the main players or companies that produce these systems. Um, this uh, this e-lecture is going to be divided into two parts. The first part uh, will cover main, most of these um, uh, points and the second part then we will focus mainly on uh, metal-based systems. So what is additive manufacturing? Um, it's, there is a wide set of terminologies, and this is very much to do with the fact that additive manufacturing is a relatively new technology uh, over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, it's referred to as 3D printing or rapid prototyping, additive manufacturing, additive layer manufacturing, solid freeform fabrication. And in many times it's misused. Um, there are names which are misused, which are referring to um, trade names, of specific manufacturers, uh, selective laser sintering, selective laser melting, um, but generically powder bed fusion is one of these, it covers all of them. According to the ASTM F42, which is a, a, a new um, standards uh, which is being set up specifically for additive manufacturing, uh, they took a long time to come to this, but they decided that additive manufacturing is defined as process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer, as opposed to subtractive manufacturing methodologies. And it may have synonyms such as additive fabrication, additive processes, additive techniques, additive layer manufacturing, layer manufacturing, and freeform fabrication. The last of these, the freeform fabrication, is one which the, uh, has been adopted uh, quite widely uh, in the US. Um, so we well, introduce, we will use into usably additive manufacturing and additive layer manufacturing uh, throughout this module. Um, and we will come to talk a little bit more about these. What is interesting about the definition that they um, have come up with as a standard is that it relies upon two main parts. First of all, the fact that it comes from 3D model data. So somehow this is digital, is computational based. Um, and the second is that it differentiates itself from subtractive processes in its definition. Okay, so additive as opposed to subtractive, which is, it seems quite logical, but there is a possibility there might be hybrid processes which do both. Um, but at the heart of additive manufacturing is the basic process, whereby we create a CAD, 3D CAD model, we somehow convert that CAD model into a file format, which is acceptable for uh, the software, which will break it down into uh, a, a smaller set of layers. That will then, on most machines, require a piece of software which slices the file. And this, this file that gets used is often the STL file. Um, the, the file will get sliced by a piece of software uh, into a series of layers, which is in the uh, according to the machine. It will add support structures. We will look at orienting the part within a build platform uh, and uh, or a build envelope. And at this point, we might make decisions about how long we want the process to part. We might have a, th uh, a thicker layer, uh, have the accuracy of the part. Maybe there's some of the material properties which you know will come out of it will be determined to the strength of the part. This slice STL model will then get exported to the machine in a way the machine can understand it. We then start the build, and starting from a base plate or platform, we build upwards sequentially, one layer at a time. And this is where there is a departure between different additive processes. So depending on the materials you're using or uh, the, the feedstock, you can have blown powder, you can have wire being melted and laid in layers, you can have powder in a bed, which is um, fused. Um, and now again, yeah, so it is determined a little bit by which, which materials you're working, whether it's metals, polymers. 
Finally, when the part comes off it, there is a post-processing, a series of post-processing steps to try to achieve the quality of the part that you want. And that invariably re requires some removal of the supports to get it off the base plate, some curing, heat treatment, um, polishing, surface cleaning, sanding, shop peeling, um, maybe uh, having it in a vibratory trough. Um, and those, and that's, that is the, the sequence of builds, which is quite generic across most uh, platforms of additive manufacturing. You can see on the right there a particular part which has been built here at Swansea, um, which shows a part which would be very difficult to make, if not impossible to make, in almost any other part. And starting from powder, we have two uh, hollow cubes which are interlocked, um, and you can see the final interlock cube with the support structures which were removed and removed from the base plate. And I will be bringing these parts to the uh, uh, seminars with us. You can have a look at them. Um, you can sometimes see where the support structure uh, was originally where it's been removed. So let's use a material-based classification uh, of the different processes. Uh, material and uh, also trying to divide these processes up mechanically. Um, we have a range, laminated, extrusion, wire-based systems, granular or powder-based systems, and then light polymerized and inkjet printing. Okay, so some of these obviously by the nature of the process are restricted more for um, polymer-based systems like the inkjet printing and the light polymerized. One of the original was the stereolithographic system or SLA system there. Um, what we're gonna focus a lot on in this course are the powder-based processes here. So um, processes such as uh, specifically uh, selective laser melting, or also known as uh, selective laser melting, direct metal laser sintering, or uh, powder bed fusion. Those names are often interchangeably used. Uh, of these powder bed type systems is the electron beam melting, with a different heat source, um, but we also have selective heat sintering, laser sintering, and then blown powder deposition where the powder comes down the uh, nozzle uh, with the laser uh, coaxially aligned with the nozzle. Wire-based systems, depending on the, you can have electron beam freeform fabrication and wire arc additive manufacturing, which is being developed Cranfield University. Um, other systems to the left here, again, these are more polymer-based uh, systems. Um, you can have an extrusion type system where almost like toothpaste, you have a fused deposition modeling. This is the sort of best known of the sort of small uh, personal-based type 3D printers used a fused deposition modeling system. And you can have a sort of a laminated object manufacturing. And these go back quite a long way to the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s for rapid prototyping. Um, wide range of materials being used for additive manufacturing processes. So here's uh, from uh, the Wohler's report for 2012. Uh, polymers, composites, metals, uh, hybrid metals, ceramics, investment casting patterns, sand molds, cores, paper, etc. Um, and you can see the different processes as they're applied for these. So you can see if we were to pick out the metals, uh, you do actually have some metal jetting binder um, powder bed fusion. So the powder bed fusion tends to be one of those processes which has a wide range of different, um, materials you can use with it. Um, there is, just to add to, to the amount of materials, this is a, a very small uh, sort of sub uh, high level set of uh, the, all the different materials that can be used. Even chocolate was used uh, to print uh, and sort of food printing, and then you've got a whole set of new different um, processes being developed for scaffolding building and biomedical applications with uh, down to cells. The, the range of processes can be really wide. So here we've gone from the large on the left, which are called the macro scale, all the way down to the nano scale. Um, so on the macro scale, you might have something there more suitable like wire arc additive manufacturing or electron beam melting or some large powder bed systems that work with metals. Where you, and, but even like um, uh, systems that work with polymers, like the Object 1000 has a one meter scale um, be, uh, build envelope. Uh, so we can have greater than half a meter. Uh, typically for the metal based systems, this comes with a relatively rough finish and you tend to have more near net shape. So you have some machining afterwards. All these holes here, for example, might have been machined out of the part. 
and the layer thicknesses can be much larger than, um, than we might have in the powder bed, um, allowing these parts to be built in uh, relatively fast times. On the uh, smaller scale, macro scale here, we're talking about parts which might be of the order of up to 250 cubic millimeters. Um, so um, these would be powder, most of the powder bed fusion systems um, that we get now, typically typically the base plates around 250 to 500 mil squared. Um, so slightly higher accuracy, um, lower surface roughnesses possibly, and it's, uh, but typically strengths can be higher than cast. And there is a big thing we're going to talk about in one of the chapters later on is about the relative strength of parts which are made by powder bed fusion. We can have a range of layer thicknesses going down from 20 micron to 150 micron, uh, depending on the powder bed system. Powder sizes typically uh, for additive manufacturing, 15 to 45 micron powder bed powder si sizes, but often um, with uh, electron beam, we'll be talking about slightly larger powder size distributions. And again, this is something we'll talk about when we come to the um, chapter on powder manufacturing. Uh, micro scale, uh, so these are more specialist machines that are available. Uh, it is possible to have very small layer thicknesses, very small focuses, uh, the diameter of the lasers, and powders which are verging on the micro nano um, size, allowing us to make very small uh, builds. These are quite specialist. On the nano scale, these are more, uh, everything on this plane downwards, you're pretty much dealing mainly with polymers, have the accuracy, uh, they might use laser lithography. Um, might possibly be coated with metal, have a metal coating through uh, some sort of um, vapor deposition, but you can get some incredibly small pictures. This is a, a picture of something that was built, uh, you can see it's 20 microns, it's like a shape of a spaceship. Uh, and so you can get feature sizes right down to 100 nanometers. Um, it, this shows the potential for the, not, um, the 3D, the, really the, the development of, the, of, uh, of additive manufacturing has come very much from the uh, uh, rapid prototyping back in the sort of the early evolution, late 80s, early 90s. Um, uh, Chuck Hall got a, a patent filed in 1984 for stereolithographic apparatus. And from that point onwards, there was a rapid generation of a few different like fused deposition uh, modeling. Um, companies are starting up like 3D systems in, in the US, mostly looking at plastic uh, polymer based systems uh, in, in the early 90s, uh, and a lot of them sort of being developed to actually work as a tool in the investment casting um, uh, sector, where casting patterns can be generated much more quickly than being cut from uh, wax. Um, so Parts were being laser manufactured for tools as early as the uh, mid 90s. Um, uh, but from about the late 90s onwards is when there was a real explosion, um, particularly the metal based systems started coming in. We're gonna go through this in a, a bit more of an incremental step at the moment. Uh, and that's taken us through maybe to 2013 where uh, as many as 45,000 new machines were being sold in a year. Uh, and uh, the real explosion in, in what is potentially a new uh, process and manufacturing came to be. But I said the first steps in rapid both timing was in the early 80s, and it all started with Chuck Hall uh, here uh, through his development of the stereolithographic apparatus, yeah. which had all the initial um, sort of uh, forms of being able to work uh, in a, on a layer by layer basis, making relatively large components. Uh, DTM Corp was formed in the US and 3D system later on. Uh, first powder polymer based systems uh, developed at Austin, Texas uh, by Carl Deckard and Stratasys was founded. So these are 3D systems and Stratasys are still uh, very much in existence. Uh, so non-SLA non systems for rapid prototypes were based on laser sintering and uh, material deep, uh, deep uh, extrusion were developed through the early 90s. Um, they were pretty rough and ready components at that stage and needed quite a bit of uh, machining. Not necessarily, they were 3D prototyping for visualization rather more than uh, for any sort of real functional use. Uh, fused deposition modeling from Stratasys, coming out with machines. Um, cubital form this solid ground curing. Um, laminated object manufacturing developed by Helisys. Uh, and MIT 
uh, developed uh, and patent 3D printing patents and licensed it to Z Corp, uh, or Z Corporation in 1953. So a lot of the early uh, 90s, uh, the mid 90s, sorry, uh, looked at uh, developing machines, which the idea was that there would be one of these in every office around the world. Um, which and they were meant to look a little bit like photocopying machines. So there's a lot of commercial development to the rapid process. Uh, lower cost systems for bringing the cost down. Um, here you can see in, uh, the Z Corp and 3D printing and Stratasys machines. So you've got the Genesis there from Stratasys in 96. Z Corp produced the Z402 in 1996 there. Uh, and um, 3D printing, inject printing of the WAC to a 2100 there from 3D printing. A lot of this all working in plastics and wax for the direct for investment casting. Um, so focusing on getting larger SLA systems. Um, and there was a first attempt at some of the metal-based systems. So Aeromet produced one, but we don't see them so much more now. Um, EOS started, um, produced the first direct metal laser sintering, direct metal laser sintering at Fraunhofer, which is now uh, marketed by EOS. And they produced the EOS Int M250-95. Uh, the S700 in 96 and the P360 in 96 there as well. Um, EOS sold their SLA systems to focus mainly on the metal-based systems and Arkham founded uh, their first electron beam melting system. And this is really the start now of uh, the rapid production of new generation machines. I would call them the first generation machines uh, in the early 2000s. So SLM, uh, GmbH is a German company, launched their first SLM laser powder bed system. There you can see it on the lower right. A French company called Phoenix launched the direct metal laser sintering SLM system solid to 3D systems in 2013. Um, Concept Laser launched their first M2 system uh, there. Um, Arcam launched their EBMS 12 system in 2012. EOS launched their uh, M270 um, direct, metal, direct metal laser sintering fiber laser instead of earlier CO2 lasers that they were using. And here in the UK, we had MTT launch their SLM realizer, selective laser melting realizer 250. So this is real uh, sort of explosion of different companies making different um, technology, different technologies. And a lot of the metal based systems uh, had a global lead here. So we had uh, France, Germany, UK, Sweden, all working on different technologies uh, and really leading the way in terms of the metal based systems. And this is something which is acknowledged by the US. Um, so through the mid 2000s, a lot of the focus went then on sort of trying to uh, increase the uh, commercial, commercial use of their machines, uh, bigger builds, smaller lasers, new materials. Um, Stratasys signed a deal with Arkham to distribute electron beam metal machines in the US. So that was quite a big thing where they focused upon medical applications. Um, new materials were being added to the system. So a lot of these had been worked with one or two materials. And there was an explosion of different materials that tend to come out. So systems as like cobalt chrome and 74 pH. Cobalt chrome, um, typically used in uh, biomedical applications. 174 pH is a precipitation hardened uh, steel used for tooling applications. So this was something which um, developed these systems, these, uh, these materials. MTT launched the SM, SLM Realizer 100 in 2006. You can see that uh, system. Right. Late 2000, um, two th uh, uh, so um, Arcam developed a uh, larger build volume for the A2 system. Uh, for aerospace. MTT partnered with 3D Systems to launch machines in the US uh, in 2008. Concept Laser, another, um, so they launched the updated version of the M1 Laser Cushing. Laser Cushing just means laser melting in German uh, on a 250 cubic millimeter um, build volume. Arkham launched the A1 uh, specifically for biomedical orthopedics uh, implant production there. Um, 2009 saw the first uh, sitting of the ASTM committee uh, for the development of uh, standards for the additive manufacturing. And in 2010, uh, the um, FDM patent expired. Now, this is, I've kind of focused more on the metal side, uh, as you can see already, we're going through this history. Uh, the, the, the expiration of this FDM patent um, 
it led to a sort of rapid take up of lots of different players in the um, you know, sort of private uh, sort of non-commercial systems sort of use for, for use for home. And that's what you'll see, uh, you know, so when you go to Maplin or, or, or these, these sort of uh, small systems. Um, throughout 2010 and onwards, there's been quite a few changes, a lot of shuffling in the market. Uh, there was a join at one point between MTT and SLM. So they split in 2010 and MTT was purchased by uh, Renishaw, who we know now in 2011. Um, and SLM, the uh, German company who they were originally um, with, launched the SLM 280HL, which had a 350 mil um, build height with the usual 250 mil square base plate. Um, materialized a lot, uh, developments in the software. Um, so materials was purchased, uh, materialized, which was uh, the software then was purchased by Marcam, um, which is now um, has led on to um, uh, Magic. Ponzi, we bought our own machine, our first one, AMT50 in 2012. Uh, at 2013, Arcam released the Q10 for uh, biomedical implants, and that replaced the A1. Rennie Shaw launched the AM250 Plus Pack in about 2014, which was an upgrade of the AM250. Um, and in 2015, Rennie Shaw launched the AM400, which has a um, higher power laser of uh, 400 watts. And this is the one, one of the machines that we have uh, down in, um, uh, in the pilot line. And SLM launched the uh, 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 SLM500, which uh, this is a reference not just to the laser power, but also to the um, build volume. So this actually had a 500 by 500 uh, base plate with a 500 mil um, height. Throughout that period of time, that critical period from 1990 to 2010, if you look at the AM equipment patents worldwide, you can see this explosion of patents and this has continued to increase. So over the last seven or eight years, this has gone right up um, here. Uh, a lot of activity in the markets and there's a lot of worldwide interest. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, Europe has always had a strong position on the metal uh, on the metal side of additive manufacturing, and there has been a wide number of projects through from Amaze, which was set up at the European Space Agency, which uh, finalised just last um, last year. Uh, Swansea was part of this, right the way through through these other ones, uh, Merlin, uh, Nanomaster, Aerobeam, all projects, a lot of money being put into uh, the development of the research and development into the machines. Um, previous projects include Impala and Atkins. You can look at all these up if you're interested to see what was the state of the art in uh, research development. Um, that pouring of money through the European Commission into, um, or into uh, development of the technologies for additive manufacturing was reflected across the world. And Obama actually recognized that uh, in his speech, one of his speeches that Europe was a world leader in metal AM and put a massive amount of money uh, of $1 billion in data manufacturing. Um, so, and a lot of uh, research centers um, did very well from this in, in the US. Uh, and almost uh, in reflection to that, Singapore, China, uh, had, um, put a, a large investments into additive manufacturing as well. Um, we've seen a lot of, there's still a lot of movement. Um, of course, that is on the European basis, but then uh, each of our um, respective countries within the Europe has also recognized their strength. And, um, you... Okay, so um, we were just going through uh, some of the types of AM systems, uh, just to summarize some of them here. Uh, on the polymer side, we've got via VAT polymerization, uh, polymers and thermoplastics, material jetting, to mainly polymers and thermoplastics, material extrusion, again, polymers and thermoplastics, binder jetting, uh, polymers, thermoplastics and ceramics, um, sheet lamination, a variety of materials, direct energy deposition, which is mainly metals, and powder bed fusion, so plastics and metals. You can see here another table uh, by which these materials are identified for the different processes. Um, we can, there are a whole bunch of advantages and disadvantages of the various systems. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these right now. Um, you can have a look at them 
at your own time. Let's go on to having a look at some of the main players and some of the individual systems. We'll start off with the plastics. Um, uh, the commercial available systems, uh, equipment for manufacturers, which include companies such as Concept Laser, Renishaw, SLM, Arcam, 3D Systems, Stratasys. Um, most of these are in the powder bed. Some of the commercially available systems are listed below. Uh, we'll see in the next slide. Um, so there is a lot of changes in the, in the market. So one of the exercises that we're going to do in the first seminar is that I'm going to give each of the groups a different name uh, of a company, and they're going to go look at an existing system that's marketed, and then also looking at um, sort of state-of-the-art developments uh, which are being uh, shown off at uh, trade fairs. Um, anyway, let's go through some of the plastic systems first. Uh, so here is one of the uh, old um, systems, uh, the iPro SLA. Um, and this can make some pretty big components using the uh, stereolithic graphic method. Um, they can be made from various resins of thermoplastics. Um, one of the uh, interesting parts is often with the plastic side is that uh, the waste materials cannot be reused. Uh, and again, with this, there's plenty of uh, post-processing required. You need to remove the support, cure, need to sand and finish the components. Here's a, an EOS system for selective laser sintering. Um, and they can make quite large parts as well. They don't require support materials, um, uh, but the powder itself has a limited amount of reusability. Uh, so again, there is uh, sand blasting and polishing required. Mostly these work with uh, plastics. Um, fused deposition modeling, this is one of the larger production type systems. Uh, although they create small components and systems provided by companies such as Stratasys and others, um, the fused deposition modeling has been very um, widely available over the past four or five years. Um, it does require support removal. It can be done by breaking or etching. Um, it, does work, it works with plastic primarily, but also waxes and some composites. Uh, 3D printing polyjet. There's a, a small sort of uh, office type system and a more uh, larger production system. These are generally plastics, but it includes resins and rubbers. They can make small and uh, large parts. Um, there is an object 1000 at Swansea, and this has a build envelope of 1000 millimeters by 800 by 500. They can use rubber -like materials, ABS, um, and um, it's worth having a look at if you get a chance. Okay, so this is the second part of e lecture two. We're talking about um, introducing you to additive manufacturing processes. And we're going to talk about metal, uh, metal uh, production. Uh, so there are basically three types of metal-based systems. Uh, and I've used uh, this uh, classification system here, whereby we classify according to the heat sources and according to the heat, the feedstock. So uh, we can have powder-based systems, uh, powder feed systems where we feed wire or um, powder and wire feed systems. So you can see wire and powder being the primary two feedstock materials. Now for the heat sources, we can have lasers, electron beams, or uh, TIG or MIG plasma arc sources. Um, and if um, you carry on down, you splitting down these classifications. So systems, uh, the powder bed systems um, here with the optical lasers, um, you have powder bed and blown powder. Uh, if you have the powder blown down, uh, you have laser cladding or direct laser deposition or powder, powder deposition, direct metal deposition as well, and different terms for laser cladding type systems, uh, selective laser melting uh, or powder bed laser fusion uh, come under this system here. Um, if the system is electron beam, we can have a powder bed system. Uh, so electron beam with powder bed, is uh, the, the system that's uh, produced by Arcam. Uh, if you have electron beam with a wire, we have the Siaki type systems. And then if we have these um, plasma arcs or TIG arc uh, with a wire system, we have the wire arc additive manufacturing. And this is something that's being produced at um, Cranfield. The powder bed fusion systems take a typical kind of um, layout where you have a laser coming in and you have a galvanometer scanning, which moves a small mirror, which then uh, goes through a focusing lens and lands onto uh, the powder bed. 
powder is either comes down a hopper or comes from a powder delivery system through which is a, another powder bed at the front with a rake that comes over, pushes the powder into the powder bed system, and then the Z stage drops the powder bed down as the component is formed within the powder bed. All of that is contained within the chamber, which might be argon or vacuum. Direct laser deposition is when powder is blown down uh, coaxially with a laser. So you have um, a laser comes through the galvanometer and that is focused down uh, through um, uh, nozzles where the powder is carried by a gas through the nozzle and this is deposited on a plate and you get the uh, build up uh, and, uh, on top of the plate. Wire-based systems such as the Siaki system use an electron beam to melt a wire which is fed uh, and that is deposited in layers almost like toothpaste and you can build up walls onto a substrate. That is very, so the previous one uh, is very similar to the wire arc additive manufacturing, it's just the differences in the uh, heat sources that are being used. Um, this table one here represents um, the, uh, the process and gives you sort of the relative build volumes. Uh, this is actually a couple of years old now and it gives you some idea of what the energy sources are. Uh, so for the powder bed, uh, we've got the ARCAM system, electron beam system, EOS, sorry, metal laser sintering, and then all these others like the wrench or concept, Phoenix, uh, all classified as selective laser melting, although we prefer to call them powder bed fusion, uh, laser powder bed fusion. And you can see the very, very similar for the powder bed, very similar sort of sizes. At this stage in time when this paper came out, um, they were around about 250. Um, some of these systems have gone up in size now. So, for example, uh, SLM uh, is now the German company. Uh, so they are producing a system with a 500 millimeter size base plate. Powder feed, quite a wide just, um, number of different systems with a wide range of uh, different sizes from large to extremely large. Uh, so meter by meter by meter there for the Accufusia. Um, the OptoMech is one of the, the lens system here is one of the most uh, well developed. What you do see is the, the large difference between powers in the powder bed and the powder uh, powder feed. Um, the powder feed systems will typically be one to two kilo, or up to five kilowatt plus. Uh, and they may not necessarily all be uh, yeah, um, iterbium fiber. Um, and typically the electron, the, um, the the power of the lasers in the powder bed system tend to be lower, 200, 400 watt, although now 500 watt is a sort of standard. Wire feed systems like the Siaki, which has been the uh, um, sort of benchmark for this system going back a long time, to make quite large components, much higher powers here, uh, 40 kilowatts plus, um, and what is it on there is the wire arc additive manufacturer at Crownfield, and they also have 5, 10 kilowatt um, uh, CO2 laser, um, uh, lasers. So, powder bed fusion systems. So these typically have uh, either an optical or electron beam uh, source, heat source. Uh, systems can sinter the powder or they can melt the powder using lasers and they can use electron beams to melt the powder. Um, here we have an example, which is the um, EOS system, um, the MLS 280, EOS int. Um, the EOS M280 is uh, an old system. Um, now really the difference between sintering and laser melting is literally in, the, in how much power you apply. Um, so if you keep the power low enough that the metal is only, it sinters but it doesn't actually melt it. This, um, the, but the laser types and pull powers are pretty similar. Um, you need, here's uh, the laser concept laser, laser Cussing, which is uh, the X-Line 1000R. And this at this time was the biggest uh, laser melting machine for um, large functional components, technical prototypes, uh, automated powder delivery. Um, and very similar to the REN 500, which is uh, the more recent Renishaw. Uh, but this does have a very large build envelope of up to 630 mil, th mil high and a 400 by 500 mil plate. And you can see here that it has a continuous uh, laser, one kilowatt fiber laser. 
This is one of the more outdated machines, uh, which is the, we will used to have at this university. Uh, it, it was the AM250. Um, it uses iterbium one um, micron fiber laser to fully melt a uh, 200 watt laser, and it fully melts the powder, and it uses a wide range of different alloys. Um, we're going to go into quite a bit of detail on this machine uh, in uh, in the next chapters and mechanics of the powder bed system. Uh, there are newer systems, and we've had two newer systems installed at the university here: the Ren 400 and the and the Ren 500, Ren AM 500. Um, so here's the electron beam Arcam machine. Um, so it is similar to sets of laser melting, but it uses an electron beam. Uh, the powder is generally larger in terms of powder size distributions, uh, about 100 micron. And there is a sintering step um, that sinters the powder. Um, the part is still supported to the base plate through support structures, but the sinter powder has to be sandblasted to expose it. As a result, you tend to get slightly higher uh, surface roughnesses. It's uh, more powerful, so the electron beam uh, is the equivalent of about 1,000, 1,500 kilowatts of laser power. And it has a larger spot size as well. It is it has a very fast build, but again, this surface roughness tends to be surface high. Uh, there are a number of usable alloys, and one of the things that this can do, this machine can do, is it can actually melt um, because of the high power in it. It can be done used on tungsten um, and uh, other high melting point temperatures. Pros and cons of different powder bed fusion systems. Um, so we've got direct metal, metal laser sintering, electron beam melting, selective laser sintering, and selective heat sintering. Um, so a range of different materials. Uh, the sintering ones will include both metals and um, plastics, although the uh, melting ones where you use steel, cobalt chromes, nickel alloys, titanium alloys, and uh, you tend to get denser components with the melting route, um, you higher speed, um, and less distortion of parts, the electron beam. Um, the finishing operations, and quite a lot of finishing operations on the uh, metal-based systems. Electron beam, uh, there is some issue of uh, there being uh, X-rays generated. Now, the direct laser deposition systems, this is more difficult to classify into different um, companies that make them. So this is where you have the powder delivered through the nozzles down and it gets focused. And it lands in the same place and melts within the melt pool zone. Um, it, it has a lot of different acronyms, a lot of different companies that make them. So these are a number of the different acronyms that they use for um, uh, uh, laser deposition. You can call it laser cladding, direct metal deposition, uh, lens, laser engineered net shaping, um, and so on. But here are a couple of um, companies that do direct laser deposition. So there's Beam from this system has been superseded by the Beam Mobile Cloud Machine, which is a small 500 watt example. So this is one of the smaller direct laser depositions, this is the Trump 3000, and it has an 8 kilowatt CO2 laser. Uh, this is the laser engineered net shaping, which is one of the original ones developed at Sandia National Laboratories in the mid-90s. Um, but it was sold to Optimec, and, and they, um, they sell it um, commercially. They, have a do, they do do a smaller system. Uh, 400 watts with a 1,000 well, 100 cubic millimeter um, build envelope, uh, lens MR7, and a large lens 850, which is a 900 millimeter cubed uh, 4 kilowatt system. Uh, and it will have multiple uh, nozzles for um, faster speed rates, deposition rates. Um, so, the other system to worth mentioning here is the wire arc additive manufacturing, which is being developed at Cranfield University. Relative to the um, in a prototyping stage, uh, not being sold commercially, um, and basically a laser on the end of a of a of a robotic arm, um, but it does have some benefits. It's very fast, um, and um, they 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 they're building parts from lots of different materials. Here's an example of a, a wing stiffener uh, made from titanium, and one of the things that um, they are very keen to stress here is that in comparison to uh, machining that the buy to fly ratio is low although you can see there's still quite a bit of machining still left to do to finish off the part but the buy to fly ratio is much lower than it's, it's almost one to one so there's only 10 percent waste of material uh, when using wire arc additive manufacturing 
Right, and so if you're interested in go, having more time, go back through the presentation, have a look through all these different pros and cons of the different processes. And um, what, uh, just one last slide here to mention is that uh, here are some approximate range of costs. So show you the costs of these machines have come down a lot. At the time in 15, some of the personal type Q Pro ranges of uh, personal printers, 2,500, 3,500, these are coming down. Project, for example, 10 to 15,000 uh, for the, all of these are the sort of plastic type machines. Um, and you can see what we have got here is uh, some estimates of the high metals based systems where selective laser melting systems were upwards of 100 or 400K. These are um, thought to be coming down all the time. What we've seen here over this, um, e -lectures, this set of e-lectures on this chapter on the introduction and manufacturing, uh, the evolution of additive manufacturing from rapid prototyping. We've talked about a range of different machines that do plastic and metal systems in production. Uh, we've looked at them in terms of them, uh, categorizing them as materials and process. We've learned what the ASTM standard for additive manufacturing is and uh, all the generic steps that are the heart of the um, uh, of a layer by layer additive process. Um, specifically, we focused then on metal systems and we've seen that there were uh, three basic types of metal fabrication, the powder bed fusion systems, uh, there were sintering systems, full metal, metal melting of powders and electron beam based heat sources that melt the powder as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about direct laser deposition, which is also called laser cladding or direct metal laser deposition, and a few of the systems go with that. And we've also talked about wire fed additive manufacturing or WAM um, uh, there. So direct metal laser sintering systems use slightly lower power than lasers, lower, power, lower laser powers, but can be faster. Um, and, uh, and they aim to create slightly denser components of some materials. Powder bed systems use similar fiber optic lasers with higher powers. State of the art is now currently at about 500 to 1000 watts, uh, as opposed to two or three years ago, where we were talking about 200 to, 200 to 400 watts. Electron beam melting, um, is roughly equivalent to about 1.5 kilowatts, works with both higher melting point materials, and it can make bigger components faster, but they tend to be rougher and need more post-processing attention. Uh, all, all of these processes have as-built densities ranging from 92-90%, depending on the material. The new generation of machines are going above 99%, 99.5%, so we are talking about very low porosities. Um, but there is still the issue of residual stress, which we will come to when we talk in the material chapters on materials uh, and pro process control. Direct laser deposition and wire fed AM make larger parts, and we're talking very much larger parts, anything from a meter to four or four, five, five meters parts. They do not require additional support structures, but they're, in terms of the uh, geometrical complexity, uh, they're more constrained. Um, they particularly vertically and find undercuts and overhanging surfaces is very challenging. That's the end of this uh, e-lecture two, so go and have a go at test two on Blackboard.